Okay, everybody. So I'm gonna keep us going in our OBGYN module, and next we're gonna talk about the emergency department care of the lactating patient. And as we're getting started on this, I want to put you in one of your shifts. You're working a shift in whatever the low acuity version is of your department. So maybe it's a, you know, a fast track, or maybe you call it an urgent care. Whatever it is, it's a unit where they take doctors who trained for seven or eight years to become expert resuscitationists and make us spend all day seeing sniffles, sore throats, and chronic back pain in a manner that I can only assume was designed specifically to make us all exceptionally crazy. But either way, that's where you're working. You've taken care of a young woman, you've treated her ailments, you've decided what's wrong with her, and you're deciding you're gonna prescribe a few medications for her and send her on her way. You've answered all of your questions and you are walking out the door, your hand is on the door handle and she says, oh, but doc, did I tell you I'm currently breastfeeding my six month old baby? Can I even take these medications? And your heart stops and you freeze and your hand is still on the door handle and the first thought that goes through your head is, oh my God, I have no idea. Because you, like most of us, had one lecture on emergency or on medications in pregnancy and lactation back in your second year of medical school, and you have no idea what you learned. That's your first thought. Oh my God, I have no idea. Your second thought is, oh my God, I have eight more patients that just got triaged. Well, I had that thought. What am I going to do? Your third thought then is that you breathe a sigh of relief and you go, it's okay, I've got an ED pharmacist. I'll just ask her. But then, you're horrified again because you realize it's Saturday. And while you work in a 24-7, 365 emergency department, your department has decided to staff this one crucial member for just business hours from Monday through Friday. And you think, that's terrible. And now you're back to horror. Because again, you don't know what to do. And another eight patients have been triaged and they all have chronic back pain and they're asking why they haven't been seen yet. And you've still been in that room and your hand is still on the door. And now you think, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, lady, I don't know. You should probably just pump and dump. Out of an abundance of caution, we always just revert back to, you should pump and dump. But I'm going to argue that that's probably not the best strategy. This is not going to be your typical rebellion lecture with a, an evaluation of the literature, because to be honest, there's not a whole lot of great literature on this topic. And also, I don't think that's the most valuable use of our time here. Instead, I want to persuade you that you should actually care about this and that the blind application of a pump and dump strategy is hurting our patients and it's hurting our families, their families. And I want to give you some tools to turn to in that time of need. So first, what do you need to know? So medications are going to diffuse into the breast milk based on a variety of factors. But more lipid-soluble medications and things that are non-anionic non are going to diffuse more rapidly. And things that are highly protein-bound are going to diffuse less rapidly. But either way, it doesn't really matter because most medications are going to be detoxified by the neonate without any problem, just like they'd be detoxified by you or detoxified by me. So we really need to argue for a pump and dump strategy that interrupts lactation only when it's crucial to do that. And why is that? Because breastfeeding is good. We know this. We know that infants who are breastfed have decreased risks of type 2 diabetes, obesity, asthma, ear and respiratory infections, and sudden infant death syndrome. We also know it's good for the moms. Moms who breastfeed have decreased risk of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, ovarian, and breast cancers. And we also know that the moms want to do this. According to the CDC data, babies born in 2015, four out of five of them started off breastfeeding. So moms clearly want to do this. But by six months, only half of them are still breastfeeding. And by 12 months, only one third. So we're falling off in our ability to keep these mothers breastfeeding. And that's bad, ultimately, because according to the World Health Organization and UNICEF, these babies do need to be breastfed, and they need to be breastfed as long as possible. They recommend a strategy where babies are breastfed exclusively for the first six months of life, and then they're breastfed alongside appropriate solid foods up until two years, and sometimes even longer. So I do want to get into the medications because that's what's most important to you but I'm not actually gonna expect you to memorize a list of medications in a 10 minute talk. So the most important thing, and if you listen to nothing else I say, listen to these next two slides. These are the resources that I want you to have on shift. First is LactMed. This is a searchable internet-based database brought to you by the National Institute of Health. It's online and it's also available in a free web app. You can go in and type in almost literally any medication and get specific really easy to interpret medical information about whether this medication is safe to use in pregnancy. 
or excuse me, in a lactating patient. The second resource is infant risk. This is a 1-800 hotline number available during business hours in central time. And what I like about this is it's probably not what you're going to use, but you can give this phone number to your patients, and they can call it, and they can ask for advice on something over the counter that they might want to be taking without your advice. So let's get into the medications. There is one set of medications that I do think you should just memorize, and it's the only time I think in emergency medicine that we don't actually have time to think about something or look it up, and that's intubation. You should know that Atomidate, Propofol, Succinylcholine, and Rocuronium are all perfectly safe to use in a patient who's lactating. But what about ketamine? Some of us are moving toward using ketamine for RSI. Unfortunately, the data is not super great or, or uh, compact on this yet. It's not out. The data is not out. So we think that ketamine is not getting into the breast milk when it's given to human subjects, but we don't really know. So the guidelines right now are to avoid using this medication if you know the patient is lactating. Now, I will say, though, that those guidelines are really probably designed for the anesthesiologists who are taking their time and planning an intubation up in the operating room. If you are intubating a mother who's nursing in the emergency department or out in the field, you need to do whatever you have to do to save that patient's life, and that's probably using whatever you're comfortable with. Nursing and lactation are a secondary issue at that point. So now, the second category I want you to know about is not a time-sensitive one, but something that we do so frequently, I don't want you to have to think about it. And that's that iodinated contrast and gadolinium, both perfectly safe. No need to pump and dump, okay? So now moving on to uh, a, few, a few other topics. So the care of the lactating patient is often focused around the safety of the medications, but that's not the whole patient issue. And I gave you some resources that you can look up all sorts of medications. But I want you to think about a few other issues. And that's this. I want you to be asking your patients if they could be lactating. We are really good about asking patients if they are pregnant, and then we don't believe them anyway, and we order a test OC. <laughs> but we never ask if they could be lactating. If we just ask anybody, any young woman of reproductive age, if they could be breastfeeding at home, if they are breastfeeding at home, then we'll know far earlier in the care of our patients, and that's going to affect every decision we make, and we're not going to be making a panic decision with our hand on the doorknob. The next thing is that these women who are nursing, they need to be feeding their infants or pumping at least every three to four hours for a couple reasons. One, to maintain their milk supply, and two, for their own comfort. I don't know about you, but in my ER, any patient who's getting any amount of workup is probably going to be there for at least three to four hours. And certainly, if you're going to be admitting them, they're going to be in my department for more than three to four hours. Your hospital has breast pumps. Do what you can to facilitate the pumping needs of your, of your nursing mothers. And the last thing I want to talk about is a disease process that's not entirely specific to the lactating mother, but pretty specific, and that's mastitis. This is the painful, red, swollen breast tissue that's usually caused by nipple trauma or it can be caused by some clogged breast ducts, uh, the milk ducts. Treatment for this within the first 20 hour, 24 hours is with warm compresses, anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, and frequent pumping or nursing. If the patient doesn't improve within the first 24 hours, then you're going to be adding antibiotics, and these are your choices. And if they don't improve even after you start antibiotics, be sure to consider a breast abscess and get an ultrasound. And the most important thing about the treatment of mastitis is that they need to continue breastfeeding or pumping throughout. Because like I said, one of the major causes is clogging of the, of the pores of the ducts. And so if those are clogged, the only way to treat that is to continue pumping or breastfeeding. And there's really no reason to stop. So to summarize, your go-to intubation medications are a go. These women need to be feeding their babies or pumping at least every three to four hours. So make sure to help facilitate that while they're in your departments. There are great resources online to help you make these decisions. This is a chart made by Lauren Westifer of the Foamcast uh, podcast, and she has a great post on this, a wonderful quick reference table that I encourage you to just save on your phone or at least know that you can go find quickly. And when in doubt, if something's not on those, turn to lactmed or infant risk. Thank you. <laughs>